For nearly two centuries, societies have weighed the merits of free market capitalism and socialism. Debates continue over which system maximizes prosperity and better promotes human flourishing. Free market capitalism decentralizes economic decisions, giving individuals control over what to produce, how much to charge, and what to buy. Their decisions are informed by market prices, which convey important information about scarcity and consumer value. Proponents contend that capitalism delivers the best economic outcomes by giving individuals incentives to create and produce. Critics, on the other hand, point to the persistence of poverty in market economies and rising inequality as proof that capitalism fails to deliver broad-based prosperity. They maintain that this inequality ultimately gives the rich disproportionate economic and political power. In contrast, Socialism grants the government the authority to make most economic decisions. The government chooses how to allocate scarce resources based upon what it determines to be most useful to society as a whole. Proponents argue that socialism ensures society's resources are fairly distributed. Critics claim that socialism fails to give people proper economic incentives to innovate and produce, which ultimately reduces economic opportunities for all. Opponents further argue that socialism's powerful central governments become autocratic and threaten political freedom. So which system is better for humanity? For as long as this question has been asked, the debate all too often devolves into name-calling and emotional arguments that fail to advance the discussion. And yet, it is imperative that we keep asking. The Human Prosperity Project at the Hoover Institution seeks to overcome these preconceptions. It employs analysis of free market capitalism and socialism and its many variants to assess how each system affects human flourishing. Good morning and welcome to this speaker series of the Hoover Institution called the Human Prosperity Project. I'm Russ Roberts, the John and Jean Denault Research Fellow here at the Hoover Institution and founder and host of the weekly podcast, Econ Talk. This series is based on research and commentary from Hoover scholars participating in the Human Prosperity Project on socialism and free market capitalism. The overarching goal of the project is to investigate the historical record to assess the consequences for human welfare, individual liberty, and interactions between nations of various economic systems. Go to hoover.org slash human prosperity project, hoover.org slash human prosperity project to find essays and videos from this series. And those of you listening live during today's presentation, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions as the conversation begins. I'm joined today by two Hoover colleagues, Neil Ferguson and Victor Davis Hansen, to discuss the history of socialism and free market capitalism. Both have written essays for this project that are available online at hoover.org. Neil Ferguson is the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and a Senior Fellow at the Center for European Studies at Harvard, where he served for, for 12 years as the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of History. His book, Kissinger, 1923 to 1968, The Idealist, won the Council on Foreign Relations Arthur Ross Prize. His latest book is The Square and the Tower. Victor Davis Hansen is the Martin and Illy Anderson Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, the author of numerous books and articles on war, the ancient Greeks, and history generally. His latest book is The Case for Trump. He was awarded the National Humanities Medal in 2007 and the Bradley Prize in 2008. Gentlemen, welcome. Neil, in 1942, Joseph Schumpeter published Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. And he asked if capitalism would survive. What was his answer? His answer was no, Russ. Uh, uh, this is what Schumpeter wrote. Can capitalism survive? No, I do not think it can. And he went on later to write, can socialism work? Of course it can. Now, it's important to know uh, that although he was a Harvard professor when he wrote those words, Schumpeter was in fact a conservative who did not regard the answers to his own questions as good news. Uh, he wrote, I think, in a spirit of wartime fatalism, uh, arguing that the forces that were making socialism seem more and more attractive uh, were very hard indeed to, uh, to resist. Uh, so I, I 
started with rereading Schumpeter when the idea came up of, of, of writing about capitalism and socialism. And I was startled to find how well it read, actually. I, I hadn't read it since I was an undergraduate, but actually it's, it's a good read. Great book. Part two, especially. Big fan of that. Uh, Victor, what are your thoughts on the sustainability of, of capitalism? Does it, uh, does it have a chance? Yes, it does. A, a lot of these questions were posed uh, at the turn of the century, but all the way into the 40s. And this was before really the implementation of the capitalist uh, support or capitalist economies that incorporated things like the eight hour work day, the 40 hour work week, social security, that whole uh, safety net, so to speak, that is constantly expanding, but it's really changed the dialogue. So when people say can capital capitalism can't survive, it was a period in which the middle and lower classes didn't have the social protection that were not only implemented, but were eventually felt, at least in their nascent form, not to be incap incompatible with capital. Now let's go back uh, a century before that, roughly, uh, to Marx. Uh, Neil, you wrote in your essay that, quote, Marx famously called religion the opium of the masses. If so, then nationalism was the cocaine of the middle classes. It's a great line. Explain what you mean. What, what's the role of nationalism and the middle classes in, the, uh, in this conversation? Well, Marx and Engels uh, got a couple of things wrong. I mean, it's not that they invented socialism, by the way. That idea had been around uh, since the 1820s and, and was a part of a debate about the Industrial Revolution that... Uh, that, that really crossed uh, the conventional ideological lines. There were plenty of conservatives uh, who were nervous of capitalism, not least the great Scottish critic uh, Thomas Carlyle. But by the time uh, Marx and, and Engels came on the scene, what they were trying to do, Marx in particular, was to kind of synthesize uh, German idealist philosophy from Hegel uh, and uh, the, the ideas of political economy, particularly those of David Ricardo. Uh, and the idea was that you had a dialectical theory of history, a model of, of, of historical dialectics, plus Ricardo's idea that wages were inexorably going to be ground down to subsistence. And the core prediction, which Marx spent uh, the rest of his life uh, refining in dust capital was that the tendency of capitalism was for widening inequality to grind the proletariat down into the dust until the point came when uh, the expropriators would be expropriated. Well, two things were wrong with this theory. One was uh, that, in fact, industrial capitalism did not grind wages down to subsistence level. The more industrialized countries had the highest wages. This was absolutely clear by the uh, time that Marx was writing capital, and it became even more obvious in the second half of the 19th century as time went on. But the second thing that they missed was the way in which nation states and the idea of nationalism would in some ways transcend the appeals to class interest uh, that were central to the whole uh, socialist and communist project. The proletariat uh, would not, in fact, unite uh, against the capitalist class because national loyalties would be more important than class loyalties. And uh, when it came to the crunch in 1914, uh, there was no way that a general strike uh, could, uh, could stop the outbreak of World War I. There was no way you could stop uh, the peoples of the various European countries uh, rallying to their national standards. And indeed, the attempt to have a meeting of the great uh, socialist international failed altogether, and the, the Congress did not take place in 1914. And I think that illustrates the, the great mistake that Marx made, which was, was to underestimate uh, nationalism as an ideology. Yeah, that's, um, Victor, I'm going to let you respond to that in a second, but I want to ask you know, one follow-up to that. You're suggesting there's a sort of um, a tribal urge that has to be satisfied, that, that, that Marx saw it as being class-generated and it was dominated by nationalism. I mean, can I be both a nationalist and a socialist without being a Nazi, pardon the <laughs> confluence there, but could, can I support my nation in a war and at the same time be fighting for a revolution at home? Just one of the 
great questions uh, of, of the 20th century. Uh, is there some kind of synthesis possible between nationalism and, and socialism? And uh, the national socialism that emerged in Germany was just one of many uh, attempts to come up with uh, a fudge. Stalin actually came up with a version which was socialism in one country. Uh, the, the, this this was a kind of uh, preoccupation uh, really uh, right across the left uh, for much of the 20th century because it was obvious uh, that the appeal to a kind of international proletariat uh, kept running into uh, political barriers. Um, the, the Russian Revolution itself, uh, which Lenin and Trotsky thought would go global, ran into a, a, an impenetrable wall in Poland uh, where it turned out that actually, no, the Polish working class and indeed the Polish nation was not about to simply roll over and embrace uh, what was very clearly a Russian revolution. So I, I think this, this was a, a, a preoccupation uh, and, and a puzzle really for socialists right down to our time. Uh, I, I can remember my myself uh, as a student watching the knots that members of the Labour Party would tie themselves into uh, on questions of national security, insisting that no, they really were tremendously patriotic, but at the same time, they'd quite like to get rid of nuclear weapons unilaterally because the Soviets were really not going to do anything bad after all. So I, I think this, this problem never quite got solved. And it, it's been one of the great weaknesses of socialism as an enterprise, almost from the very inception. Victor, you make similar points but from a very different perspective. Uh, Give us your analysis of the role that nationalism has played in the evolution of socialism as a, as a successful or failed movement. Well, it, it's funny that Marxism and socialism, the less uh, toxic brand, I suppose, of it, have always argued that class interests transcend national boundaries and they create a secular religion. And then in extremists, and they disparage, therefore they call the alternative to their theories uh, cocaine, or opium, as did Marx, but in extremists, when, there's, when their backs are up against the wall, it, whatever system it is, whether it's national socialism in Germany or whether it's Soviet communism, remember what happened. Hitler thought he could get rid of the Catholic faith. He couldn't do it. Stalin had almost abolished and destroyed Christianity, Orthodoxy, and Soviet Union, yet it lingered on. And finally, an extremist people were allowed, say, during the, Russia, the German invasion, to continue to worship. It's funny that after he came out of his self-imposed exile after the shock of Operation Barbarossa, the first thing that Stalin did was drop the word comrade and start addressing everybody about the motherland. And they owed Mother Russia their allegiance. In other words, even the most diehard extreme socialists remember, uh, at least believed that religion and nationalism were stronger Im human impulses than was this sort of abstract idea that uh, workers of the world would unite uh, across national uh, boundaries. Victor, in this current moment, movements like Brexit uh, and the rise of populism and nationalism elsewhere, how do they interact with socialism in your view? Because we seem to see both sort of on the rise at the same time. We see a rise in populism and nationalism and an increased interest in socialism in the United States of all places, and I'm sure elsewhere, but we'll get to that in general, in particular in the United States, but I'm curious how you see those two things happening simultaneously, or do you think I'm wrong? I think you're right. I think in the EU, there was uh, this idea that there was going to be a new European man. And as Neil has written, when Kissinger got wind of that, he said, who do I call? The, is there a president of Europe? And the point being is that for all of the rhetoric of the EU, there was no ability to create a new European man based on common class uh, affinities. And even whether it's today been transmogrified into global warming or uh, abortion on demand, whatever the particular cultural issue is, nationalist concerns are much stronger. And so the EU is now being, I guess, quadrisected in the sense that the Southern Europeans have real differences over finance as uh, Spain, Portugal, Greece, and Italy with the Deutsche Bank. The Eastern Europeans have very nationalist uh, 
concerns about illegal immigration that are not shared by Western European Brexit, of course, where a lot of British thought people thought, you know, I have more common uh, affinities with people who have long residence within the confines of the United Kingdom and speak English and have a proud military tradition than I do with the Belgians or the Italians or the Czechs. And in the case of the United States, uh, we were very dissatisfied with the NATO-EU contributory obligations. And I would just notice um, there is a rule throughout history that socialism tends to enter uh, in, I guess, it, I guess the word would be weaken the ability for defense because there's this formula that every, every uh, drachma that's spent on hoplite armor comes at, at the expense of social, of social activism and welfare or every tank or every airplane. And so whether it's the Grand Fr uh, French Army of 1940, people ask themselves, why did, the, why did an army that stopped the Germans at Verdun a mere 20 years later collapse in its six weeks? It's the same question people ask in late fourth century Greece when Demosthenes and people said, how did we stop 180 to 250,000 Persians at Salamis with a very poor city-state and we let 30,000 of these crazy Macedonians come in. And the answer was, well, his, he said people weren't paid to vote in those days as they are at Athens. And the theoretic fund uh, didn't dominate. And we didn't have all these social programs. So that's been the problem with social. Let me see it today with the EU. They cannot meet their 2% contributions. Germany, I think, is 1.3. And people usually follow what Germany does. And the, and the excuse, apparently, is that if we were to rearm at a very minimal level, then we would be taking mother's milk out of children's and things, or children's mouths or whatever. But it always has to be an either or uh, dialectic with the socialists. Well, economists talk about the trade off. Can I just jump in, Russ, if I may? Yeah, go ahead. I, I feel as if we need to draw a pretty clear distinction early on between uh, socialism on the one side, which implies a uh, significant violation of the rights of private property uh, up to and including complete expropriation. And uh, post-war phenomena, uh, Christian democracy, uh, social democracy, uh, and indeed uh, the welfare state, which emerged uh, in the mid 20th century, because I think a lot of confusion in the United States arises from conflating these things. Uh, and one of the arguments I make in my paper is that as far as one can see, when, when young Americans say they're in favor of socialism, they're not actually in favor of the expropriation of the means of production and the state control of the commanding heights of the economy, which would be, uh, I, I think, a strict uh, interpretation of socialism. They are essentially saying, and I get this from listening to interviews with people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, we would like the United States to have a welfare state and a tax system more akin to that of, uh, of Western Europe. Uh, and I think when you ask the question, Victor, why did the Germans not pay uh, a higher share of their, their contribution, a higher share of, uh, of the NATO budget, it doesn't really have much to do with socialism because Christian Democrats, as much as social Democrats, have tended to keep uh, defense spending down and free ride on American defense spending. So I, I prefer it if we try to kind of keep that distinction clear, because I'm not sure that we're really talking about socialism a lot of the time in the United States. We're, we're just talking about should taxes on the rich be higher? Should there be universal and free at the point of, uh, of service healthcare, that kind of stuff. And to me, that's not socialism. And it was never how socialism was understood by the people who set it out as an ideology in the 19th, uh, in the 19th century. I just very briefly like to respond. I think that may or may not be true, but there's a trajectory that socialism and I'm not a determinist, but it seems to always want more of from the individual and more shared property. I'm looking out the window at a San Joaquin Valley vineyards, and I'll give you one example of what I mean. In 1936, there was something called the Raisin Administrative Committee, and that was to help the farmers find a market. And basically it said this, you don't own the produce on your own vineyard. You don't own it. In fact, it's a felony for you to dry your own raisins and sell them. They belong to the US government. And so when you 
uh, harvest them, we take them and we stack them in a, a big uh, lot and they're called the reserve raisins. And then we determine how many can be sold in the United States and the rest will be given away or sold cheaply below the cost for cattle feed or brandy or overseas for poverty program. And anybody who tries to sell those raisins and acts as if they own them will be charged with a felony. That's still in operation today. And so a bunch of bureaucrats determine, uh, and I did this for 30 years, they determine even though they didn't plant the, the grapes, they don't own the property, they say, but they were going to put me in jail if I decided to harvest them and say they were my own property. I'll give you one more quick example. I decided uh, I didn't like the 110 degree summer, so I wanted to be able to build a swimming pool. And I went to get a permit and the county said to me, you don't really, we're not gonna give you that permit because you don't really own your roadside. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, in about 50 years, we wanna widen Mountain View Avenue. So we wanna take 30 feet for uh, 300 yards in front of your frontage. And I said, well, that's my property. Are you gonna compensate me? Not if you want to get a permit. So maybe we will in the future, but if you want a permit right now, you have to deed over this property to me. And I could go on about the abuse of eminent domain. So you're right that maybe we don't have that final um, sense of a lack of uh, private property, but I think the idea of an individual autonomous citizen with absolute freedom over his own goods and services and property has been highly reduced and redefined. The interesting thing to me, Victor, and sorry to cut across, across you, Russ, again, is that that kind of administrative logic and, and indeed abuse of eminent domain goes back a long way in American history. And in, ma in many ways, what's striking to me about the history of the United States is that it's happened really without the underpinning of a socialist ideology. I bet you the, the, the bureaucrats who you've dealt with in, in California don't think of themselves as, as socialists, although they may do. Um, going back through the, the, the history of the United States in the, in the 20th century, the encroachment of the federal government as well as of state governments on the rights of individuals hasn't really been driven by social Socialism in the way that socialism drove uh, countries to the left in Europe and indeed in much of the rest of the world. Let's not forget that after 1917, the most extreme version of socialism, which aspired to create a communist society, became extraordinarily prevalent, not just in, uh, in the Soviet Union, but uh, all over Asia, in, in parts of Latin America, even in parts of uh, Africa and the Caribbean. But the United States is a kind of outlier here because really socialism has not been a successful political brand in American history. Mm -hmm. And the stuff you're talking about, I think, comes from a different source, which is the, the strange way the administrative state expands its bureaucratic reach without necessarily a powerful ideological or certainly not a socialist ideological rationale. Well, what I'm suggesting is that when the right or the capitalist uh, interest says that I'm, I want eminent domain because I want to tear out this part of downtown Fresno or LA. And I, I'm not doing it because there's a public need for a highway or a bridge or a reservoir or a pipeline, but I want to do it to encourage economic development. And I feel that these 50 little small businesses can be liquidated because I'm going to build a Radisson hotel with a big parking lot. And it'll be for the, it'll be good for the economic development. And that is, you're, you're quite right in the tradition of crony capitalism, but the people who support it and the bureaucrats who welcome it uh, tend to be more liberal. And it's very weird how capitalists work. They give a very uh, socialist argument and they call it capitalism. And then they employ the administrative people who believe there is a role to expropriate property, not for necessarily the ostensible common good, but for a more abstract idea of the general welfare. And that's what we see all the time. We see a lot of capitalists acting as if they're socialists on, predicated on the idea that a lot of people are socialists that are in government and will support them. Well, Milton Friedman liked to point out that most business uh, leaders were not capitalists. They were capitalists for the other industries, but their own was special and needed 
you know, this subsidy or that to make it work right. Uh, and the idea that they are taking advantage of the natural impulses of others is um, kind of the essence of, of crony capitalism, which I would contrast with what I call the real thing. Um, uh, one which of our viewers, Mike. His argument, Russ, I mean, one of the reasons that Schumpeter was pessimistic back in 1942 was that he felt that there was a tendency uh, for the free market to produce, if not monopoly, then big businesses and, and corporatist relationships between business yep. and the state that that we're really undermining the free market as a, as a scheme of, of organizing society. Yeah, but he he was mainly, I think, in my memory, talking about the, the implicit economic power that arose from that kind of concentration. This, of course, is a combination of business working with the power of, of government as a very monopolistic uh, entity. Well, what, what's interesting about Schumpeter is he, he kind of gives four reasons why he thinks socialism can still win, even in the United States. One is that the, at, it, at, its, at its best, capitalism leads to creative destruction, and that means that there are losers as well as winners, that, that there is this tendency for monopoly or at least big businesses to emerge. But he also makes two great points, which are really worth reminding people of. Uh, the, 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 the third reason he gives is that capitalism creates, educates, and subsidizes a vested interest in social unrest, which means left-leaning intellectuals and academics. And then he adds that socialism's irresistible to to bureaucrats and elected politicians. And so that nexus between uh, big business and, uh, and, uh, and the bureaucracy, I think, is there in, in Schumpeter's uh, argument, as is, and he sees this coming, the fundamental hostility of academia, of the intelligentsia, to the free market. I mean, and if that was obvious in 1942, think how much further to the left the academy has got uh, since the 1940s. I mean, if you took today's Harvard professors back to the Harvard of 1942, they'd be absolutely appalled because it wouldn't be nearly woke enough. So I think that was a really important part of Schumpeter's argument that has turned out to be very true. There's a vo virtually no intellectual support for the free market and a great deal of intellectual support for socialism in American universities today. And the Hoover Institution looks increasingly like a little island uh, in a sea of, of left-wing ideology when you just look at the universities. Well, one of the old arguments on that line was that academics resented that they weren't paid at the top of the pay scale, uh, that, that mere entrepreneurs were compensated so much more, and that obviously meant that the system wasn't just. Of course, today, academics are doing quite well, partly, I think, due to the subsidies that the government gives us. Uh, it's interesting that we have not become, on average, more uh, capitalist. What are your thoughts on that, Victor? Well, I, I, I think the, the key to understanding higher education in America is to di distinguish what they say and what they do. If you look at the pay differential between a part-time teacher without benefits or tenure or paid to teach the same class as a full endowed professor, it's a greater disparity than a greeter at Walmart and, and a, a district manager. And then if you look at their, the criticism of capitalism, they really are crony capitalists rather than uh, socialists on the barricades. By that, I mean, they have no moral hazard when they issue these student loans. They expect the government to underwrite $1.4 trillion of student debt, and they have no obligation, ethical, moral, or elsewhere to say to their graduates, we can determine, take an exit test, adjudicate, calibrate that you're now better educated, you're better able to earn a living, have a family, buy a house than you were before you came to college, although maybe statistics suggest that's true. And we're going to uh, cut costs so you, that you won't go into debt. But once the moral hazard is shifted to the government, then there's no incentive to discourage anything from a latte bar to a uh, rock climbing wall in the student center to uh, 16 diversity and inclusion czars. And then finally, uh, which is really kind of disturbing is that when we pile up these endowments and they're all tax deductible and they're getting into 17, 18, 20, 40, 50 million, billion, billion dollars of endowments. 
then they really, the taxpayer is underwriting in a crony capitalist fashion what administrators and full professors and, and all of these people are doing, and they're not subject to the laws of the market. Maybe this COVID virus and the quarantine and Skype and what we're doing today will give some market reality to them because obviously there's gonna be someone who says, I can download Nobel Prize winning lectures and hire somebody very cheaply to correct papers and cobble together uh, a Skype class and maybe get it accredited and I won't have to charge a Harvard or Yale student stay home at 60 or $70,000 a year. And I think the universities are gonna be very worried about that because inadvertently they might be subject to the laws of supply and demand and market value. Neil, do you wanna comment on that? Well, I do think that if one's trying to explain why in polling, it's the youngest uh, age group of, of Americans who have the most positive view of, of socialism, the least, positive view of, uh, of capitalism, and that's a very striking feature of recent polling, then you have to attribute at least some of this to education. Uh, and if you look at the ways in which the major universities teach modern history, uh, it is very striking how few courses are available on the realities of socialism. Uh, whereas there are all kinds of courses that tend to call themselves the history of capitalism, that in close inspection are in fact uh, pretty much so socialist in their, uh, in their doctrine. So I think there's a huge skew in the way economic history in particular is being taught in major universities. And there really aren't enough courses on the realities of uh, the Soviet Union, uh, the realities for that matter of, of Mao's China uh, and, and, and indeed, I think that's the, the reason that we've got this category error amongst millennials and Generation Z. They think socialism is Sweden. And I think, as I try to argue in the paper, that, that that's just a complete misunderstanding uh, of, of Sweden, but also of, of socialism. I mean, the interesting thing about Sweden is that when at the height of Swedish social democracy, they really did try to violate property rights. They were prevented from doing so, uh, and, and the rule of law was upheld. And beyond that point, uh, the, the tide of socialism uh, uh, retreated in Sweden. And if you look at Sweden today, and I did some homework on this uh, for the paper, it, it ranks ninth in the World Economic Forum's competitiveness ranking. 12th in the World Bank's ease of doing business rankings and 19th in the Heritage Foundation's economic freedom ranking. So if Sweden is a socialist state, then it doesn't really have any meaning anymore as a word, because in truth, uh, Sweden's actually a place where, where capitalism is very dynamic. Yeah, the fiscal system is certainly doing more redistribution uh, than it does uh, in the United States. Uh, but I think it's a complete mistake to, to say that that's socialism. And if we just use socialism to mean higher tax rates, I think we're going to lose sight of the very, very important historical lesson, which is that when socialist regimes are established and are able to violate private property rights on a much larger scale than you're talking about, Victor. I mean, this is not just a question of uh, uh, preventing you from uh, building your swimming pool. When they actually come and confiscate the land and tell you you're gone, uh, indeed shoot you because you're a, a former landowner, that's what they did in the Soviet Union. That's what they did in the Maoist revolution after 1949. They expropriated and shot the landowners. If we forget that that's the core dynamic of socialism, that's what grew out of Marx and Lenin, um, and, and Marx, Engels and Lenin, then I think there's gonna be this ongoing confusion about the dangerous nature of socialism. Socialism, wherever it's been tried in the sense that it was intended by Marx, has produced lawlessness either extreme authoritarian regimes or chaotic regimes, anarchic regimes. T take your pick, Cuba or Venezuela, which would you prefer? And I'd far rather when people talk about socialism, we point them at Cuba and Venezuela than at Sweden, which is no more socialist in, in reality than, than the UK or really the United States. I mean, California and Sweden, I mean, come on. But I think, I think the question, I wanna take a question from from one of our viewers, Mike. Mike asks, is it possible to combine cal capitalism with a strong social safety net 
that assures that every resident has at least a roof, food security, health care, and in the 21st century, reliable electricity, high-speed internet, and high-quality educational opportunity. So my question for both of you, we'll start with you, Victor, is that, so that's socialism with a human face. There's no uh, re-education camps of Mao, no famine promise there. It's maybe a little more, it's Sweden with a big, little bigger safety net. Does that, does our discussion of, say, Cuban and Venezuela have anything to do with what looms? If we were to expand the, the size of government in the United States, is it just a, is, is there a point where the, fr the frog gets boiled enough that it tra transforms into something more hideous? Or is it, can we prevent that? I mean, I'm against both of those. I'm against socialism and a dramatically larger government. But a lot of uh, young people, as, as Neil has, has argued correctly, I think, are with the, when they say socialism, they just mean a more activist government. What's wrong with that, Victor? I mean, do the lessons of socialism apply there outside of the, you know, the, your raisins? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think that if you looked at the U.S. economy, say in January or December of last year, we had record uh, low minority unemployment. We had about 3.5, 3.4% unemployment, pretty good GDP. We were, and yet we had a pretty generous social net to the extent that we were running still massive budget deficits for social programs. So the key is that to pay for the socialist agenda, you need to have incentives. I think we kind of squared that circle pretty well between encouraging capitalism and socialism. But remember, there were a lot of people that were unhappy about it. And Niels talked about the youth. And why was that? Why did people say, why am I unhappy? And I think we had forgotten a couple of things and it came from two sources of dissent. The first were, and we can see it on the streets of Seattle and Portland, we have had a entire uh, generation of young people, and Neil's right, they were indoctrinated, half of them went to college, but when you saddle that number of people with $1.4 trillion in student debt, and then you give them uh, a, a veneer of education that they're articulate, but they're really ignorant because they don't have the inductive method of thinking, they're not inculcated with that, they don't have an arsenal or toolbox of facts and data about the past or present or the natural world, and then you turn them loose on society and they say to themselves, well, my grandfather at my age was married. They had two children, uh, three children. They had a house, they had cars, they didn't have any debt. What happened to me? Who did this to me? And they're articulate enough or they've been trained enough to know that there's methods of ex exegesis that can explain that dissent, this dissent. At the same time, we had this globalized project and it was wonderful in the beginning. I mean, it gave eyeglasses to people in the Amazon and antibiotics to people in Chad and the Western means of production were Xerox across, but somehow we got into this matrix that the country, the states and the cities with a window on Asia from Seattle to La Jolla and a window on Europe from Boston to Washington or maybe even Miami, they, uh, they felt, well, all of a sudden, people in law and business and the corporate world and media and academia, we have a market now of 8 billion people, 7 billion people. And the people in the interior who had muscular labor or who were in entrepreneurial and they had a craft or a production that could be Xerox abroad, much cheaper, whether it was making wine or peaches and Mexico or a laid worker's work to be outsourced to Korea, whatever it was, then they didn't do too well. And we considered, we confused cause and effect. So we basically said to them, and I'm talking now just to interrupt about the constituents that voted for Donald Trump on the right or Bernie Sanders on the left. We basically confused cause and effect. We said, to the uh, Trump supporter of the Midwest, well, you were a meth head or you're dysfunctional and you didn't learn to code or you didn't keep up with uh, the global economy. And we said to the people on the left, well, nobody told you to go to college. We didn't say you've been had by college and they sold you a, bit, a bill of goods with less information given to you about what your major will earn you and the debt that you will incur then when you sign up to buy a car from a car agency, they, they inform, inform you of the moral and financial hazard far more honestly than any university does. So that, there was a lot of discontent. 
and that that's where we are right now. And the, the cure for it was, I think, to unfetter and unregulate to some degree the economy to get up to near three percent GDP, full employment, and and that would uh, and then to prune away programs that have a failed record and and enhance ones that don't. And I think we're pretty much there. And then you know I just finished very quickly is that. I don't like these uh, either or comparisons, but the United States has about 330 million people. 50 million of them were not born in the United States, they're residents now. In my state, California, our state, 26 to 27% of the population was not born in the United States. And yet we have a GDP of over $20 trillion with 330 million people. And Europe has about 450 million people it has a GT, GDP of about, I think, 18 trillion annual GDP. And I think it's per capita income. Now they're gonna argue they have all kinds of different problems, but I think they're not as, they're not as significant as ours. And their per capita income is about $20,000 less a year than ours. So whatever we're doing, I think we've erred a little bit more on the capitalist entrepreneurial side. And I, I, I take seriously, Neil's excellent point says that California, I think, is more socialist, but I think it's still an outlier. And we've erred a little bit more on the capitalist side than Europe has, and it's it's rewarded us for that reason that we're material richer. And we can't, and that's just using GDP. When I go to Europe and I look, I always ask myself, how many square feet are, are the lower middle classes and the poor allowed in Europe to live in or possible to live in? How many air conditioners in the window do I see? how many televisions, how many cars. And then I look at where I am now, and I'm living in a, a, a town with a per capita income is $14,000 a year. And this Southern Fresno County has a poor per capita in, income than Appalachia. And yet when I look at apartments and I look at the square footage and the price and the number of new cars, and we, whatever it is, we have a consumer uh, culture that's far, far richer than Europe in terms of satisfying the appetites of the lower middle classes. Neil, do you want to respond to that? Well, yeah, I do. I mean, I think it's dangerous to make comparisons that are, that are quite uh, as broad brush as that. The U U.S. does have a massive resource advantage and, and, uh, and, a, and a space advantage over Europe where population density is, is, is far higher. Uh, but I, I'd like to, to couch the, the, the the thing a little bit differently. Ultimately, we know what happens, to go back to the, the listener's question, when you raise uh, direct taxation and you gradually increase uh, the state's uh, share of, of GDP and you, and you increase the amount of redistribution that happens, because we ran this experiment before. Uh, and what's startling to me about the current debate in the United States is that essentially the Democratic Party is, is campaigning now uh, to do one of the biggest tax and spend extravaganzas uh, in American history. I mean, not only are they going to raise taxes, uh, uh, starting with the corporate income tax, but probably moving on uh, to capital gains tax, but they're going to increase spending at an even larger scale, could be three, could be $5 trillion of, of new spending. Now, we know from past experience where, that's, where this leads, because even the US has tried this before. It's not that we need to go looking to Europe for insights. If the core goal of uh, progressivism, social dem democracy, whatever you want to call it, is to use the fiscal system uh, to increase the number of benefits that are paid, expand the provision of healthcare, spend more on education, spend on infrastructure, and at the same time, increase taxation, especially on high income earners and on corporations, it's absolutely obvious what's going to happen. Uh, you're going to end up with lower growth, and at some point, you're going to have higher inflation. And if you don't have the higher inflation, then you're going to run into the nasty fiscal arithmetic of excessive debt, uh, because we've already been going in this direction uh, for years, actually, uh, going in this direction at least since the financial crisis, if not earlier. Uh, and, I, and I think that that's a, a whole set of different issues that don't have much to do with socialism. We, we saw in the 1970s where those policies led, 
as the marginal tax rates rose ever higher on both sides of the Atlantic, as it happened in the US too. Uh, and you ended up with the stagflationary mess of the 1970s. There's a reason Milton Friedman rose to prominence at that time by pointing out why this couldn't uh, really have ended any other way. To me, it's slightly depressing to see uh, the, the, the rising probability, let me just say, that we're going to rerun this experiment expecting it to have a different outcome. And it wouldn't have a different outcome. I would just add that I think they call it gorge the bees. And so that they increase spending to such a degree that it has uh, desirable effects on cuts. And one of them will be defense. And we won't, we won't be capable of even spending three and a half percent of GDP on defense. And they, they see that as a good thing. I don't think Europe, even with a larger population and a large GDP is going to, feels that it can afford to spend 2% to protect itself. And it's, it exists because the United States spends about 33% of the NATO budget. Without it, it wouldn't exist. At least it would have to make massive cuts in social benefits or raise taxes even more. But you're right, that we've tried this thing before with, and they're advocating, remember, a wealth tax and an increase in the uh, upper income tax rate. In California, it's 13.3 upper income. I think we have 1% of the population in California paying, or 5%, paying about 55% of the income tax. They want to raise it to 16%. And when you couple that with a new proposed Biden a tax, Obamacare tax, so, uh, payroll taxes on a large part of your income, you're easily getting up to 55% of your income. And unlike the, Reg the pre-Reagan years, that's income without a lot of deduction. And so that is one of the purposes is to spend so much money that it forces uh, a vast redistribution a perceived redistribution in income. And I think we got to remember what the, the psychology is about it. Tocqueville said that, unfortunately, most people would prefer to be equal and poor than unequal and better off. And it was Hesiod that said the two most powerful emotions in the human experience were jealousy and envy, and he defined the difference. But they, it was the idea that someone else better off than you is a more important concern than you being better off. And I think that's historically a challenge of, of trying to curb socialism. There's some innate human desire to make sure that someone either through accident or inheritance or harder work or intelligence or anything does what better than you do. And people can appeal to that natural uh, instinct. And it's, as you said, we've been through this before, so why would we do it again? Because it's an, because we're human and, and it's a natural instinct to repeat this folly. Well, you both have picked on the Democrats. Um, it's not like the Republicans have been so fiscally prudent um, either recently or much in the past. Uh, I just see government getting larger. Um, we have had times with low high tax rates and decent amounts of growth, Neil. You know, it's possible. I'm not as pessimistic as you are, just that the absolute size of government's the problem, but it could be. But I wanna turn, we've got a few minutes left. I'd like to turn to the, the non-monetary, non-growth aspects of this. Uh, I wanna think about, you know, this is called the Human Prosperity Project, our, our project, but you know, prosperity isn't just about financial well-being. Uh, it's about the meaning and agency and responsibility and dignity that we get from our economic system. Socialists tend to see the capital system as cruel and rapacious. I see it as a form of cooperation that's uncoordinated from the top. Socialists uh, see socialism as a way that we can all share equally. I see it as a way that corruption becomes rampant through decentralization, uh, cronyism and lobbying to get rewarded uh, and for me, although I think socialism will lower perhaps our standard of living, I I'm more worried about it, what it does to the intangible aspects of, of life. And I'd like you to both comment on that if you'd like, uh, beyond the material, you know, the, 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 the systems that you've been criticizing in Cuba, Venezuela, the Soviet Union, when, when these processes go to their extreme, it's not just that the people there are poor, uh, they don't get much consolation in those systems from the fact that 
everybody's like them. In fact, there are people at the top who are doing great. And more than that, the actual, the, the daily fabric of life is fundamentally corrupted in those countries. So talk about the non-material part of this and it is, am I being overly worried that the welfare state will turn into such a, a, a dramatic change in our, in our way of life beyond just the material? Neil, if you could comment on that. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear from the history of the authentically socialist systems that they were characterized not only by ultimately uh, inefficiencies uh, and distortions in economic activity, uh, uh, but but just as much by the kind of moral corrosion that you're talking about. And uh, I think if, if anybody needed reminding of what it was like in the Soviet Union, it was quite worth watching the dramatization of the Chernobyl uh, disaster, which is one of the few television series I've watched in the last 20 years from beginning to end. Uh, for all the liberties sure. that it took, it captured <laughs> the fundamental mendacity of life uh, under under real existing socialism. Everybody lied, and ultimately those lies led to a, a disaster. Uh, I'd, I'd like to add another point, Russ, before we run out of time, which we haven't touched on, but it's extremely important, and that is the metamorphosis of Marxism in the academy initially uh, into something that had nothing to do with economic whatsoever, or at least barely, uh, the metamorphosis of it into identity politics, uh, critical race theory, uh, bogus notions of social justice, uh, and a whole set of, uh, of very distinctive ideas that really have nothing to do with, uh, with, with socialism, but, but offer an alternative sense of collectivism based not on class, uh, but predominantly on race, but also on sexual orientation. And the rise in, in the universities of the United States of ideas like intersectionality has created a, a whole new set of problems for those of us who believe uh, in the, the fundamentals of individual liberty, uh, not only liberty economically, but liberty politically and, and in a civil sense. And I'm, I'm almost as troubled as, as, as uh, by the, the, the resurgence of social democracy and, uh, and tax and spend progressivism uh, by this, because I think this uh, emphasis on identity, to use a term that you used earlier, of tribal identity or of uh, uh, intersectional identity is very, very corrosive, not only of, uh, of individual liberty, but, but also of, of, of national or, or patriotic identity. Uh, I, you used tribal earlier in, in that connection, but the point about nationalism was precisely that it tr set, transcended traditional tribal loyalties and created a possibility of national unity on a very large scale. That has been crucial to the success of the United States since its foundation. And I think the radical left's new form of socialism, which is the identity politics cancel culture variant, is just as threatening, actually, as the old socialism we've been mostly talking about. Yeah, I, I think very quickly, I think cultural Marxism as a sort of founder of Gramsci, I think the idea was that with the industrial revolution and the modern welfare state here in the United States, that you were not going to get socialism with a strictly economic appeal. There, were two, there was upper mobility and there was a material appetite that was being satisfied. So what's happened is we are redefining victims, not by economic uh, means or class, but by race. And we do that because race is a static idea. It's not fluid. When you, when you have people doing well, then they, they go from one class to another and you lose constituents. But under this new identity politics, LeBron James may have 20 Mercedes and Jaguars and live in a, great, in a gated estate and you know, be worth a half a billion dollars or Oprah. But he's a victim. And he said, you know, I don't feel like I can walk out. Well, he's in much less danger of walking out with his security team than a guy in Youngstown, Ohio on a forklift is. So the idea was that the left said to themselves, the system is so insidious of free market capitalism that we're losing constituents. So now we're going to turn to this idea that you're going to be part of the other for life. And Barack Obama from his Colorama Mansion in D.C. 
or his 20, 12, $14 million estate on Martha's Vineyard will forever be a victim, as Michelle has said. She said that, you know, Michelle Obama said, I can't even go to a supermarket without somebody reaching, wanting me to reach and pick up something for her. Or that when Barack walks out, who knows what's going to happen to him. Well, so it's, it was a very brilliant transformation in the status of the victim of capitalism because it's fixed. It can't be changed. So I know that as somebody who spent 22 years in the California State University system, and I served on a lot of hiring committees with affirmative action, I, finally, to get people in foreign language, we were hiring aristocrats from Chile or Argentina or Brazil or Spain or Portugal, and then we were having them come in and they were upper, upper middle class, but they qualified as a victimized minority of, you know, United States history of racism. And we instantly bestowed on them uh, the title of victim for life. It was a very cynical uh, process. And that's what's happening. I think it's a very good point because once you substitute, substitute race for class, then that victimization it, it, it creates a cynicism because people look at certain material foundational principles of one's life and they say, well, based on the person's house or their income, they've done very well, but are they, they're still a victim of our system? And I think that's, that, that's hard to do because if we know anything from the 20th century, the slow progress, but undeniable progress in the United States, we have divorced particular races from poverty, there's no necessary connection. The per capita income of Greek Americans or Asian Americans is much higher than so-called white Americans. And so I think the left hit on something and they've redefined Marxism and socialism and victimization and victimizers. But maybe can I add a very brief point? I, I, we've I had 137 questions as we've been talking and I've been trying to keep an eye on them. And uh, a number of them have, have, have prompted me to make the following observation. that The people who believe in, in a free society, capitalism, if you want to use the, the pejorative term of free markets, uh, are not indifferent to the, uh, the poor and not indifferent to the unfortunate. Actually, one of the things that motivates us is the belief that the system that we favor would in fact do more uh, for those the people than the, the supposedly more just uh, socialist or social democratic alternatives. One reason that I, uh, I feel quite passionately conservative is a sense that the left is deeply hypocritical and does not sincerely intend to help the people who are at the bottom of the income distribution uh, and, and doesn't in fact do practically much for the poorest African Americans in the most uh, deprived parts of the country. It's the hypocrisy of socialism that ultimately is its most disgusting feature. Uh, the champagne socialists that I remember first encountering as an undergraduate at Oxford, who loved to, start, uh, to stand and engage in virtue signaling, do nothing in practice for the people at the bottom of the social heap whom they never ever meet. In reality, uh, the enterprise of, of welfare social democracy usually traps people in the bottom quintile of the income distribution in various forms of dependency, ensuring that social mobility is kept out of their reach. And that's an extremely important point for us to emphasize. It's the fact that socialism consistently fails to deliver improvements in the quality of life for the poor, that it fails actually to deliver on its most fundamental claims that makes it to me especially especially abhorrent as an ideology. Are you suggesting well, I'm going to add, we only, we only have a three minutes left, but I, I want to challenge both of you. I'm going to give you each a minute. I don't think, um, I don't think our side, the so-called free market side, has done a very good job making that case, Neil, uh, that, that our system is going to work out better for the poor. They look at the poor today with, especially the working poor. There's a whole group that, can't find a job because they got a lousy education provided by a government school. But there are plenty of people who are working poor who their prospects for advancing are, are, are not what they may have been in the past. Do you blame that on socialism or, or do you think we have to do a better job in creating real capitalism or do you think that their critics have a point? I think we've done an extremely poor job uh, 
to speak broadly of, of conservatives, not just in the United States, uh, but around the world, of, of making the case for free markets and, and free institutions and individual liberty. Uh, I think we got somewhat trapped in, uh, in the ideas of the 1980s, uh, and, and we held on to the uh, the, the uh, prescriptions of the 1980s for too long, and then were in some measure hijacked by uh, by populists whose approach is not really, I think, entirely in sympathy uh, with the first principles of conservatism. I've been critical of Republicans since the Bush administration uh, for their fiscal uh, improvidence and bouts of, of hypocrisy. I've been concerned about uh, the ways in which the Republican Party and the British Conservative Party have strayed from, from the path uh, of classical liberal principles uh, in economics and in politics for many, many years. I wrote The Great Degeneration, lamenting that this was a bipartisan undermining of the first principles of a free society. I think the Hoover Institution has a, an urgent top priority mission to revive the case for conservatism and free institutions in terms of what they do for the people at the bottom of the heap. Because if we're just seen to be representing the wealthy elite, then we'll have no chance whatever uh, of winning the argument, which we can win against socialism. And we don't deserve to win it. I hope Right. I'm sure Condi Rice is listening and, and uh, do, I, do I have time to say 10 seconds? Yeah, absolutely. You got 60 seconds, Victor, maybe 75. Go ahead. Well, I think in a way that the opiate of the elite left is socialism because it's, it's a psychological process. It's very similar to medieval penance and exemption. The idea that a sinner can be free of sins through a contract to build a church or something. And by that, I mean that if you look at the concrete life of many of the elite left, where they put their children, whether they have a wall around their home or not, whether they believe in charter schools, they don't. They're, they live the life of a European aristocrat of the 19th century or, or American aristocrat. And so they create this su structure that they're caring and they want to be with the other and they want to help the other through government socialist programs. But it always it sort of squares the circle of their own existence. And so if they really worried about the other. Maybe they would have their children tutor in East Palo Alto, or maybe they'd put their kids in a Redwood City school so they could, the other could see them. Or maybe they would have a private mentorship with somebody of the underclass, or maybe they would try to, instead of give to you know the Sierra Club, they would try to help build a church in Fresno or something. But it's always abstract, and it's, it's geared to make people feel better and it's almost a religious experience for many people who are secular or agnostic that, and I think this drives the progressive movement today that all of these tech barons and all the really wealth in the country today, if you look at the Fortune 500, it's pretty much left-wing fortunes. And there are people who do, ne they never live in their own lives in any way similar to the advocacy. In fact, they use it to be exempt from the ramifications of their own ideology. And that they use that, that is this, this caring and this abstract socialism that really makes life more miserable for the people who they say they want to help, but it makes them feel far better of dealing with the problem, as I said, in the abstract rather than in the concrete. Well, we'll close on that cheerful note. Uh, Victor Davis Hanson, Neil Ferguson, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your thoughts on such an important topic. The next sessions in the Human Prosperity Project speaker series are on October 15th. We're going to have perspectives from Germany, China, and Hong Kong with Michael Oslin and Russell Berman. And then uh, you can see on your screen, I can't read it on mine uh, for our next event after that. And uh, I want to thank everybody for participating and listening. Sorry we couldn't get to many of your questions, but. We had two extraordinary uh, panelists with, and uh, thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.